can be affected with health as a priority. So, but so far, very few governments have reacted or responded to the efforts of the shipping industry. Although now we're just about seeing some glimmers of hope from Europe, all of Europe, um, uh, Scandinavia, some US ports, Australia, Japan, Korea, uh, Hong Kong, and in fact, I think even New Zealand uh, joined the, the list uh, recently. Uh, but I emphasize that effective crew changes must include sign-on and sign-off of seafarers of any nationality, not just the nationality of the port of loading or port of uh, discharge. And then let's look at the other part of the equation. Without adequate flights, crew changes cannot happen. And seafarers stuck on board for months watch the news where governments and airlines argue about the terms of financial aid offered to the air transport sector. Uh, the transportation of vital workers is apparently of secondary importance. A little bit of a background. Uh, we, we represent the dry bulk sector with 12,000 bulk carriers in the dry bulk sector with about 250,000 seafarers. Uh, and these ships deliver, and their crews, of course, deliver vital must-have commodities um, to the largest distribution of ports, anchorages, and terminals worldwide. Now, some might say that action is needed today. Uh, I would be more emphatic, and I would say that action is needed yesterday. Hmm. Um, and thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you very much, Dimitri, for those insights. We just heard that the Secretary General, um, Mr. Kitak Lim, also addressed the urgent need to resolve the situation with the seafarers. Now, what I, I find is really very encouraging is when I look at uh, all of you, you have come to bed uh, together, you have been collaborating, and you're working to find a solution. And, um, and we see the still a lack of cooperation on the governmental level. Are there any, uh, Paolo or Shadan, any thoughts on how we can really, you know, make governments move on this issue? Um, okay, shall I go first? I think it is uh, important that uh, now we have to lobby with our, you know, uh, local uh, domestic associations, with our individuals, and explain them why this is very important. Because right now, all the governments are very much focused on their own citizen and their very domestic work. But they have to understand that their domestic system runs smoothly because shipping is exist and shipping should run safely. And without our seafarers, we cannot do that. Mm. So, you know, if you ask me, we always work together very well. And now even we work more, which is very encouraging. And, uh, but to actually work together and prepare something for IMO and then make it possible in IMO is, is the easiest bit of the uh, work. And then to convince the governments and the states are the real thing. And we are working, we will continue, but everybody runs with their own time, unfortunately. Hmm. Thank you. I, I totally agree with Saddam. I mean, uh, unfortunately, governments are taking from what they think are major problems, but, but they forget uh, the shipping community and uh, the seafarers are certainly the main part of it. Unfortunately, this is uh, something is a very general thing. Shipping is not very well known in the world is not um, an industry which is always on the papers. And uh, people take for granted that all the goods that we are receiving in our normal life, they are arriving, even if, if those goods for 90% of them are touching the sea. And thanks to our people that this is, uh, this is happening. So just to Cut the story short, I think I, I agree with Saddam that we have to lobby, and but our house is IMO because it's the only place which represents us on a worldwide basis. 
Thank you very much uh, to both of you for sharing those insights. Now, uh, talking about the welfare of the um, uh, seafarers, I would like to stay with you, Paolo, for this uh, question. So besides the pandemic, uh, we've seen an upswing, unfortunately, in piracy and hostage taking, especially in the Gulf of Guinea. And this is uh, another real uh, and present threat to the safety of our seafarers. And um, in your view and the views of Intertanko, what more can be done to safeguard our crews? Look, uh, we, uh, the safety of our seafarers is, is the top of the list. And for us tanker owners, we are in West Africa all the time. Uh, what we have to say that, thanks God, we are seeing some reaction from Nigeria. And uh, we really hope that this reaction, which is not just a political reaction, they are start having assets to fight this, uh, this criminality. Uh, we really hope that they are really to put in force and bringing to justice whoever has to go. Unfortunately, COVID, a lot of all this had already had to happen, but unfortunately COVID delayed of the old procedure. We are still waiting for some level of trainee for the locals to uh, use these assets. And, uh, and uh, we must also always remember that Nigeria is a sovereign country. When uh, in the other case, which was uh, East Africa, Somalia was in a total state of anarchy. So we had to deal the matter in a different way. Here is another thing. There is, a, there is a country which respond with his own forces. We must help them to do so. And, uh, and, and of course, be vigilant that they do it. Because if they don't do it, then there's a different story. And then we have to take a different attitude. Thank, thank you, Paolo. Uh, Sadan, anything uh, to add from, from your uh, end, please? Uh, well, uh, again, um, I agree with uh, Paolo and in order to, you know, um, to make it a little bit more um, clear for everyone, the, when we say Gulf of Guinea or West Africa, first of all, if events are escalating. We see, we, you know, there are numbers, for example, in 2019, uh, 21 seafarers has been kidnapped and nine armed robberies and 37 failed attacks, only 2019. And uh, so we are working all together as very rightly Le Polo say, because you know, our seafarers is our, our top priority. And uh, there are military assets around uh, Nigeria because this is a, you know, piracy kidnapping is happening unfortunately in Nigeria, which is very different as Paolo said from Somali. And, uh, you know, France has a corvette there, Italy and Spain occasionally has a corvette there, US, you know, has a one warship that goes every year for an exercise there. Nigerian Navy has the, you know, smaller boats, and then they have this joint task force on the land. And, uh, and then there is a commercial security, guys. And so it's, uh, you know, everybody is there. And the Friends of Gulf of Guinea, along with all us, you know, international shipping associations, has been working on this. And uh, then uh, I have to say that, you know, Nigerian military recently caught 10 pirates, and that is an improvement. Uh, I must uh, say that, you know, I don't want to undermine anybody's work because we are also working all together on this. Uh, but we need to see determination and results. And, uh, and yes, COVID-19, uh, change things a uh, little bit, but there were a meeting last week that you know all our representatives representatives joined uh, with the Nigerian uh, Maritime Administration and the Safety Ag Agency, and now they are you know they have every intention to follow their plans uh, because Nigeria holds the key of the solution of this problem, and without their full commitment this problem cannot be solved. So what we can do as BIMCO and all other my fellowship association, I, can, I think I can talk every, on behalf of everybody that we will follow the development very, very closely. 
Hmm. And then because it will be staying in our top agenda. Thank you. I understand now that possibly uh, Mr. Espen Paulsen has joined the uh, the panel. Is that right, Espen? Can you hear us? I can hear you and I can see my name, but I can't see my face because it says cannot start video. And right. uh, I'm totally stressed out by this whole deal because I did everything apparently correctly, but then I made a mess of it anyway. But this is what happens in old age, you see. <laughs> pension well, uh, and pension I and walk. I, I, I got her on the other line. Um, Espen, we are certainly very happy to have you on the panel and uh, we've been touching on the welfare of the seafarers so far and uh, we talked about the difficulties with the crew uh, changes and uh, we were also now just touching on the uh, piracy situation, especially in the Gulf of Guinea. So, is there anything that you would like to sort of uh, from the ICS to, to add on? Uh, on the lower left hand corner. Can, can, can you, can you, sorry, hold on a second. Sorry. Thanks God, I'm not the only one. Huh? <laughs> there are some, uh, some, still some uh, advantages with the analog world, I would say. Uh, okay, sorry, uh, I had three people talking to me on the side and trying right. to, it, it says camera, it won't come up. So um, you will be very sorry not to see my face, I'm sure. <laughs> but anyway, shall we just uh, carry on as, um, now it says start my video. Uh, and then it oh. says, cannot start the video. Okay, well, so shall we just, shall I just go on orally or what? Espen, you just stay on uh, with your uh, voice and, and that mm. is perfectly fine. And then we will, um, as, as soon as you settle in now, we will change from the, the crew situation, the welfare of the crew situation and uh, talk a little bit more about some of the uh, longer term challenges for the shipping industry. And so up to now, we spent uh, the time on business continuity, on the pandemic uh, and some of the immediate challenges, but naturally also um, uh, sh shipping is uh, obliged to reduce the greenhouse uh, gases. And, um, and the, say, the aspirations of the IMO that all of you I know are very supportive of is, uh, is not um, a straightforward, it's not easy. And um, I'm wondering um, what are you, uh, and maybe Espen, this question could go to you first. Um, what are you uh, in your organizations doing uh, to influence the IMO and to support your members in staying on course to meet the 2050 emission reduction targets? I know that all of you probably have views on this, so, but I, if I can start with you, Espen, and, and hear it from ICS, please. Well, in ICS, as you know, we, we um, have uh, introduced uh, or tried to introduce this um, R&D fund, which has been actually years in the making. And um, all people will say that it's too little, too late and so forth. But we actually believe that that from, from an industry point of view and from association and ourselves and our roundtable members point of view, that this is a good thing because it sends a very clear signal. I would say that the industry has been extremely proactive on this, on this uh, subject. And we have worked very, very hard with the IMO to, to move the needle. And I think the industry is completely serious and committed to this. Uh, and I think that we are now in the hands of, of the IMO and, and we are urging IMO to, to, to progress because we are ready and we want to have this uh, IND fund up and running as soon as possible because we really believe in it. But in parallel with all that, of course, every responsible ship owner on this earth is, is trying to find ways in the short term to reduce uh, CO2 emissions and, and to take advantage of, of the much of the new technology that is coming out. So it's a, it's a two-edged sword. And, and um, I, I think for, for 
well-meaning NGOs, uh, green NGOs, to, to suggest that we are dragging our feet. I'm sorry, but it is just factually not correct. We are really, really trying to, to, to do this. And as I've often said, it's no, you know, the, the truth of the matter is that whoever works this out, whether it's methanine or whatever the, the, um, the energy ultimately is, it's going to be a competitive advantage. There's going to be a huge advantage to whoever figures this out. So the incentives are there. And we're all in the same boat, both, from, I think, from a moral standpoint, we want to do it because we want to do what society expects of us. But from a practical point of view, we also want to do it. Thank you, Espen. Um, and uh, I must say, I'm very impressed with the way you entered this uh, dialogue with such uh, deep uh, and good insights after having all these uh, challenges connecting. So well done indeed. Um, well, I, I, I'm, I'm brief. I'm, you know, my briefing is on completely the different subject, but, <laughs> but I hope we might come back to that. <laughs> Sadan, um, how does it look from, from your perspective? Um, I think we are uh, agreed and there is a full agreement around the round table and the full commitment uh, is very rightly as been said. And, uh, and we are not doing this because only ship owners always comply, uh, but we believe in this and we also morally attached to this. We have no alternative other than green shipping, even if the markets will be very challenging in coming one or two years and God knows, you know, uh, who and when and how, you know, everything will get back to order. Uh, but green shipping is the way that we are walking. This is the path that we are taking and walking on it right now. And we have the you know short-term uh, measurements that we are working on it. We have the long-term measurements, and we are going to fill the target um, in 2050. Uh, what is really important here is that so far that everybody is working this innovation on their corner. So that, you know, this innovation fund, if you ask me, it's not too late, it is on time because there is already existing and advanced researches. Whereas there are smaller researches that we can identify and work towards, you know, all together. Uh, because it is clear that there won't be one solution, there will be multiple solutions. Uh, so it is really important uh, for us that we keep ourselves in this green uh, shipping track and that's what we are doing. Hmm. And of course we are fully supporting the, as I said before, innovation fund. That, that will be very important research and for the research. Hmm. Dimitri, um, I know with your uh, technical uh, background and insights, you, you probably also have um, both personal views, but also maybe views uh, representing the Intercargo uh, members. Uh, anything that you would like to add, please? Yes, I mean, as Intercargo, we are fully aligned with our Roundtable Association uh, uh, members. Uh, ICS, BIMCO, Intertanko, we are very, very much aligned on, on the R&D funds. Uh, shipping is a huge industry. Um, there are many sectors and uh, our particular sector um, is, is, is in a certain way blessed by being one of the most efficient sectors because um, we, we tr we, our ships sail at, at low speeds and um, we, we, we genuinely try to carry a ton of cargo with the minimum possible fuel. And that r relates, of course, to the minimization of greenhouse gases. Um, the, the ship that has the lowest fuel consumption and therefore the lowest emissions will get the business in a, in a competitive environment like ours. This is different to liners. It's different to cruise ships. Uh, the tankers are similar. Uh, if, if, if a charter sees two VLCCs or two Cape sizes, the ship with the, with the best consumption usually gets the business. And herein lies the, 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 the practical problem. The practical problem is that however big a shipping company you are, um, it's the shipyard that generally dictates the, the technology and the specification of the vessel. This was not the case in the past. But in the last few years, shipyards, in the last 20, 30 years, shipyards want to build series of vessels for good reason. And um, even if you go with all the good intentions in the world and you, and you put quite a lot of money on the table and you say, I'd like 
to for you to please introduce these these energy saving uh, devices or 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 a better power management system or whatever it is the shipyard depending on how the market is will turn around and they'll say i'm terribly sorry but we want to build the ship in a series we have somebody else in the next room who will accept the vessel as it is it's very very dif difficult to 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 push the technology envelope um, uh, to the limit so I, I do believe that the R&D uh, will make a difference. I, I, I fully agree uh, with Shadan that we, we've left the one size fits all uh, 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 where, where, where essentially fuel oil uh, uh, powered almost every size of, of vessel from an inflatable boat all the way to a, to a, to a ULCC or a, or a Valimax uh, uh, ore carrier. So we are now going to go into a, a, a period of, of uh, I guess in English you'd call it horses for courses. So there will be there will be a lot of there will be a lot of um, uh, people following LNG and there will be people following methanol and ammonia and hydrogen. But um, it, it will be very much more sector specific. And if we if we take a, um, uh, an experienced and grown up uh, uh, attitude, uh, we will meet the 2050 uh, uh, requirements. And I think that we will substantially uh, exceed those requirements. At the moment, okay. with all good wishes, I think 2030, we're, we're going to, to, to meet very, very much. Sorry, I've gone on, to, on for a long time. No, I knew, I knew it was a risk, uh, Dimitri, asking you uh, on, on this topic with your insights. But uh, you, you mentioned about uh, the R&D uh, and the advancements in, you know, operational performance. So I would like to ask Paolo, um, you know, are the technological and operational advancements keeping pace with the climate regulations, in your view, Paolo? Now, if we look uh, to the 2030 uh, target, I think, yes, we are on the right uh, direction because we can handle that with a new generation of ships and with uh, some uh, operational um, uh, rules. Of course, jumping to 2050 then is a totally different story. And... Uh, you know, the R&D that also us uh, in Intertanko, we joined, and this proves how much us as ship owner, we believe that we have to deliver on this subject, is only that to try to guide what it could be the best solution. We do not want also because we are not going to have the resources to do a full research, but we can help the researchers, let's put it this way. Certainly, um, I remember when when the fund came out, my first reaction is been, but what, I mean, if I'm going to buy an electrical car, I'm not paying for the research of that electrical car. I, the research is already in the price of the electrical car. Why I, I should here pay the research and then pay it again with the price of a ship. But you realize that the magnitude of, of our, our problem and the magnitude of our industry is such that we really need to collaborate with the engine manufacturers and, and the shipyards in way to, to have the best solution. As Dimitri say, on the second step, the 2050, probably the best solution will be of different fuels and depending on, on different type of, of, of ships. I would like also to remember that it's not only depending on us what sort of engine and, or propulsion we are using on our ship. It depends also on the infrastructure that we need to refuel our ships worldwide. And when you talk of tankers and bulkers, you never know where you are, you never know where you go, and you never know where you're going to discharge or load. So we have to, be, to look for something which is feasible from a technical point of view but has to be extremely efficient from a, a logistic point of view. Mm. Yeah, thank you very much. 
Espen, anything to add uh, from your uh, perspective, please? No, I, not, not really. I mean, the, the, um, the, the COVID-19 situation has affected many, many things and many, every aspect of our lives, really, and, and including the IMO. And, and um, the timing is most unfortunate because with the IMO um, not having had um, meetings and that backlog now sort of piling up, um, it, it puts even more uh, pressure on, on, you know, getting things done when things when we are able to uh, to to have these um, these meetings and i but i i mean i i'm like the other my my fellow um, chairman we um, chairpersons i think we are as i said already um positive optimistic and and realistic that this that this will get done and uh, with within the time frame re re required and indeed i think as adan said it will be a multitude probably of of um of fuels used, and I and I certainly agree with with Paolo. And this is a point that comes up a lot, which is the infrastructure to go with all this. I mean, one thing is to do it, but the other thing is to have the infrastructure in place to actually service it in the longer term. Hmm. Yes, that's a, a very valid point, and I, I'm 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 really happy to to note that you are all uh, optimistic. So. I've probably taken a little bit step further um, when I have uh, talked uh, publicly about this. I've said that uh, the situation now with the COVID-19 has probably triggered a maritime renaissance uh, where we are now uh, constantly exploring new ways of working and um, we've seen increasing collaboration um, yeah, between yourselves um, but also uh, across the industry and also, uh, uh, say, with academia and, and others. Um, and uh, what are, uh, this is a question for all of you, really. So is this a, a too optimistic view that we will enter a maritime renaissance and, uh, and uh, what will be sort of the outlook uh, seen from, from your uh, positions uh, as presidents and chairman of, of the biggest organizations in the maritime sector, please. Maybe D Dimitri, you want to kick it off? Thank you. Thank you, Knut. I'll, I'll try to be as, as fast as possible this time. Uh, COVID has brought the industry organizations closer together. Um, we were already close on big issues like 2020 and greenhouse gases, but I believe that COVID has brought us uh, uh, even closer and uh, we, can, we, can, we can cite uh, issues like, for instance, the, the crew change, crew health and, crew, and uh, health testing uh, 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 issues which have been led by ICS. Um, we can talk about the closer dialogue that we've had with the uh, ITF to solve common issues. Uh, even more positive, we've been talking to IATA, and this is really a first step where the airline and the shipping uh, industries uh, have, have, have been talking and, and this should be taken forward. I mean, COVID has, has brought us closer. Um, uh, the IMO, as, as Paolo said, which, which is our, our, our house, our church, uh, they have been incredibly quick in, in responding on crew safety, on crew health, on flag state issues. But also we mustn't forget our, our actual flag states. The flag states themselves have, have really, really responded positively, uh, whether it's for extension of surveys or whether it's for uh, seafarer contract extensions, they, they've been really very, very, very positive. And, and now, of course, we mustn't forget the classification societies. The classification societies have allowed uh, remote surveys, even with drones, uh, using new te technology. So I think that um, uh, this, this crisis has, has brought us together and, and, and long may we keep the positives uh, 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 from, this, uh, 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 from this working together. Um, and um, I, I've got some technolo technological and operational items, but I'll leave those for later. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Dimitri. Um, any any uh, of um, of um, Paolo or Shadan or Espen, would you like to add something here? Um, too optimistic I, with a maritime renaissance? 
Yes, no, I, if I can, I mean, number one, I think ship owners have to be optimistic by definition because otherwise we would be doing something different. So I, it's in our DNA. Uh, certainly uh, COVID is putting us together even more. Where I would like to spend one, one word is on IMO, on, as Dimitri said, our church, it is our church. And I, I would say, we should do the possible and the impossible as a shipping association to defend her because sometimes other authorities are trying to uh, run, run a little bit too ahead of it. And uh, this is creating a huge confusion in our industry because we have, to, we have to go worldwide. And the only body who can represent us and can rule us for, for me is IMO and cannot be anybody else. Otherwise, will be a chaos and will be really, really problematic to, to work. Thank you. Knut, so I, if I, I am just... I of a church. So done. Sorry to, to uh, interrupt. Please no, go no. ahead. Thank you. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, there is a re renaissance is going on. And I think that is the, the re reason of the renaissance is the same reason why we are actually optimistic. That is correct that we are optimistic by definition, uh, but in general, I mean, who is a ship owner? And the ship owner is a person or who is ship manager or who is the shipping person? That person has a high level of adaptation. We have such a big capacity to adapt and change. Although we look conservative and we sound conservative sometimes, but you know, in our daily work, in our you know the way we look at the things, we can be even ahead of some of the people in this sense, and uh, that is very important for shipping, and that's why we are optimistic, and we and also we work as you know very rightfully. My fellow friend said that we are working together even more closer than ever, and and our house is IMO, yes. And we have to protect the IMO because otherwise we will be exposed to a very regional and harsh and unfair uh, regulation. We have to do our best. And if we can manage this, that will be the real renaissance. Mm. <laughs> well done. Espen, anything from your... Yeah, uh, just very quickly. I mean, I mean these uh, global institutions are under threat, as we know, because of the current occupant of the White House. Um, the WHO, NATO to some extent, and WTO have all uh, have all felt it, and so we we must uh, we must protect our church. That's for sure, because um, otherwise it will be next. So <laughs> we, um, we we sometimes would like it to work a little faster, but but nonetheless it is it is the global regulator. And uh, if there's one industry, as we all know, that needs global rules, it's ours. So we must uh, support the IMO. Thank you. Great. Um, if, if I could just uh, run one, uh, say, curveball uh, by you, Espen. Um, I, I'm sorry, you haven't seen this question, so it's a little bit off the cuff. But um, uh, it was mentioned, IATA, the, the airline association, as a collaborative uh, partner in this. Uh, and when we are talking about, you know, fuel options for the future, uh, wouldn't you say that there could be lots of opportunities to have a closer collaboration with the aviation industry no abs absolutely of course you know the, the two industries are different in the sense that shipping is if i could say a free industry in the terms that in in terms of that it's it's open whereas uh, airline is is much more heavily regulated in terms of uh, landing rights and so on it, it's it's more political you could say but, uh, but certainly the experience that we had when we were dealing with the early days of dealing with this crew change, we, we contacted IATA and found them very, very responsive and very quick to come back to us because we, we, were, we were painting the picture of this uh, terrible problem that we have with the crew change and the sheer scale and size of it. And of course, you know, to some extent, you could say that they they probably smelled a bit of an opportunity where they have a lot of empty plans that needed to uh, to be filled. And so, you know, we had we had a good discussion and 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 got to know them, and and they were very very quick to to help um, join our our pleas to um, to the G20 and to the IMO eventually. And 
along with the ITF. So uh, th this was very collaborative and very cooperative and a good example. And, and actually, so to answer your question, yes, I think in the future, uh, th there could be some more collaboration and um, cooperation with, uh, with the Anand industry. Great, thank you very much. Now, um, ladies and gentlemen, the time has uh, unfortunately uh, run out for our panel. Um, uh, I, I would like to thank you all very much for participating and uh, sharing your insights uh, and, uh, and uh, the views of, of those uh, important organizations that you represent here today on the, on the panel. And um, uh, to the audience, um, uh, if you have any questions, we, we didn't have the time to take any questions from the audience during the discussions, but there is a networking lounge where some of us um, will be uh, joining after this session where you will have the possibility to ask any question uh, that you uh, might still have. And um, then on behalf of all the panelists, I, I thank you for listening in and I can only encourage you to stay tuned uh, in for the continuation of the 10th annual Capital Link event. So from all of us here, thank you very much. And to the panelists, again, thank you very much. Highly appreciate the time that you spent with us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Chris. Thank, thank you. Very much. Thank thank you. you. Please contribute thank you. to the mission to seafarers, everybody who is yes. listening. Yes, <laughs> indeed. Thank you. Well done. <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.